right. Hey, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you're here today. A lot of folks who are often in this uh, service are actually getting ready for baptism. We've got a gathering of all the people. So a lot of friends, a lot of uh, new people that are being baptized. I hope you'll come and join us after this service. Like there's nothing better. These, they're family gang for the only who remembers. They're new family members. So come join us out there. It's going to be a blast, okay? I hope your fall is off to a good start. I think we're about to get like it feels like fall, maybe. I mean, not today, but I think tomorrow, I think it's going to get cooler. I think it's like 90, what is it? 90, high 90, mid 90s today. So we keep thinking. It's been hot for like like a year. I think it's been hot. And so it's coming and I think it's coming fast. So, but come on out and enjoy the fun today before you head off to, uh, to eat and whatever else you're going to do today, take a nap or something. But, um, if you're like me, it is a busy season. A lot of you have kids and you're like, I've talked to several of you even today, this week, like, yeah, we're in it. We're in the throes of it. Busy here. I mean, a lot of great things happening here. You can only, you know, choose what you will, but uh, our weekday stuff is going and it has been wild. I'm in a busy season right now, which has reminded me of the power of, of focus, because here's, here's what I've learned. You know, I've said it before that Jesus didn't talk about balance in life. He talked about the all out pursuit of one thing. And then he said, seek first the kingdom of God, right? And his righteousness and essentially everything else will find its place. The problem, I told a group of men this week, the problem in your life is you don't need more capacity. This is where we go. Our self-righteousness leads us there. Um, self-reliance leads us there. You don't need more capacity. You don't need greater capacity. You need greater focus in your life. A lot of us, just because you're busy doesn't mean that you're important. It might mean that you are not focused on what matters most. If you don't have a singular priority, you're running after everything in your life, right? So almost everything in your life is noise. Do you know this? And very few things are exceptionally valuable. John Maxwell, the the great leadership guru, he said it this way, you cannot overestimate the unimportance of almost everything. (laughs) And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about finding freedom to focus, finding freedom in in focusing our lives. And what we're going to bring, I'm going to bring clarity to every person here today. And my prayer is that you will leave with such clarity about what matters most what the Christian faith is all about, and if you claim to be a Christian, um, you'll know this is it, okay? And, and I figured this. We got three different types of people in the room right now. There are those who are not Christian, and the crowd this size, and others hear my voice. Um, you're not a believer. Like, you're, you're, you're here because you're, you're open, evidently, or maybe a friend brought you, and you're like, I know. Some of us here today, like, I know I'm not a Christian, but I'm really intrigued by this, or I love somebody I came with, or... You're here for some reason, and we're so glad that you're here. You've come, what I like to say, you've come to a safe place to hear a dangerous message because your life just might be changed today. Some of us are not Christian, and, and, and we know it. Another, there's another group of us who know, no, like I'm a Christian. Like I know I am. I understand the gospel. I get it, what Jesus has done for me. I know what it means to be a Christian. I've received that, and I'm seeking to live this life out now in response to what he's done. You're like, I'm clear. Others of us fall in a category, and some of us privately even here, but a lot of us fall in a category that's like, I, I, I think I am, and maybe I've been going to church a long time. I don't know if that makes me a Christian, but I think I am, but I'm not sure one way or the other, or I doubt my salvation sometimes. A lot of people fall in that category. And so today, my, my goal, my task, I've been praying that every person, every individual here would leave this place with with like crystal clear understanding of where you are, okay? And so I'm just going to present clearly, no, I'm going to let Paul, we'll let the scriptures do this, present the gospel clearly, what he's been doing throughout Galatians, and, and then, then let the spirit move in your life, okay? To, to decide where you are. So I'm going to ask you this, what is it that separates Christianity from all other religious faiths or ideologies, you know, religions in the world? What is it? Um, because that's where we're going to go today. Uh, some of us, you know, you might say, well, it's, you know, in a word, I asked this not long ago, maybe it's our apologetics class on Wednesday night, but you can come join us by the way. I, what is, how would you say in a word? What is it? What was, what was Jesus message? Maybe that's the way to say, it. what was his central message? And you might say, um, 
I don't know, it's love, you know, uh, grace, maybe that's central. Um, what is it? What is it? He came preaching the kingdom of God. Um, there was this uh, British conference on comparative religion years ago, and they were talking about the unique thing that each religion in the world brings to the world, like what's unique about each one. And um, someone said, well, it's got to be the incarnation. I mean, like God becoming a man, that's crazy stuff. That's Christian. That's, that's central to, to Christianity. And someone said, well, no, not really. Because, you know, you had the Roman gods. I mean, there's been that idea that these divine beings come among us and angels or whatever else. So maybe, maybe not. Yeah, but that's not God. But they've debated about this. And then, then one of them said, it's got to be the resurrection. Like, that's, that's it. Without the resurrection, Christianity really falls apart. And you could, you could argue that, certainly. But then, then someone said, no, there's other stories of people dead coming back to life. And there have been other stories like that. And, you know, but you could say, well, no other religion really claims that. And then C.S. Lewis walks in the room. And he says, in great English um, fashion, he says, what's, what's all the rumpus about? Um, a word I hadn't used uh, ever. Um, but he says, what's, <laughs> what's the rumpus? And, uh, and he told him what they're talking about, uh, that, you know, what is the unique thing that Christianity brings to, to the world? And he said without hesitation, he said, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. Because you think about it, whether it's the, the eightfold path of Buddhism, whether it's the Muslim code of law, the Jewish covenant, the Hindu idea of karma, Every other religion says you've got to do something to earn your way to God. There's something you have to do in order to get there. Only Christianity dares to say, no, no, no. God loves us for free. He comes to us. And not us trying to get to him. He comes to us and he extends this grace, one way love to us. You don't have to do a thing but believe in what he has accomplished for you in Jesus Christ. And there is such freedom in that. And this is what I want to get our minds around is this is what separates Christianity from all other religions. But here's what we wrestle with in our relative, relativistic society, pluralistic society. That, to hear that, like, wait, there's, there's one way you Christians claim there's one exclusive way, right? And I'd be like, well, uh, Jesus, Jesus said that. I'm blaming it. I'm, I'm with him, but I'm blaming him. He said he's the way the truth and the life. But did he really mean exclusive? Because I thought he was all about love. As if, right, you can't have an absolute truth claim and still be loving. That's where we are in our society right now. You know this, right? Like, like, like if you claim that there's one way, I mean, truth is now subjective. It's not an objective, absolute reality because that's oppressive. That is offensive, and today we're going to talk about how do we wrestle with the offensive nature of the gospel? Because let's be clear, if, again, if you're not a Christian, uh, you're going to hear real clearly what this is about today, okay? And then the rest of us just reminded of what, yeah, what is this again? What, why? Let's, let's, let's get back to the heart of the matter. Galatians chapter 6, go ahead and turn there. Galatians 6, 11, we're going to uh, talk about the, if you take notes, here, here it is. We're going to talk about the clarity of the gospel. We're going to talk about the centrality of the gospel, and we're going to talk about the reality of gospel of the gospel in real life. What does all this mean? Paul has been, if you've been with us throughout the entire summer, we're, we're closing it out, as TJ noted, today. Paul's summarizing here in the end, as you might think in a good speech, a good letter, he's going to say, okay, let's, let's get back to what I've been talking about. And he's going to do that, and he closes it out in, in an amazing passage that we're looking at here. But he's been challenging the Judaizers. Again, this is important, if you haven't been here, to place in context. A group of people who've come, uh, some of them Christians, some of them non-Christians, who've come into the early church in Galatia, this area, saying, hey, Paul, you know, he, he didn't love the, the, the law. Like, he shifted in his thinking. Uh, we're not with him. So here's the deal. Jesus is all good. But you have to follow the law and, yes, and receive Christ. And it, it's all, all that. They hadn't, they hadn't grasped the gospel. And anytime you have Jesus plus something, it's no longer the gospel. And so Paul says, no, 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 no. He, and that's why he's writing this letter. He's coming at them and he starts with this thing by saying, they're presenting another gospel. This is not the gospel. And it's what I explicitly shared with you. He's been on repeat to say, it's by faith, if you've been with us, not works, 
that you're saved. Faith in what? In what Christ has accomplished for us. And he starts in verse 11, interesting verse that we'll unpack just to get us there. In the context of this, been talking about sowing and reaping. He says in verse 11, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Okay, <laughs> you know, like, wait, what? What is he talking about? There's been a lot of speculation about this phrase. Maybe if you've read this before, you've heard this. It corroborates a lot with what some people believe that Paul had like an eye problem an eye issue, um, where it, it, he had this thorn in the flesh. You might remember in 1 Corinthians 12, some say, well, maybe that was it. He mentions this illness in, in, in Galatians um, chapter 4, verse 13. It's when he met, he met them and he was ill. And they, they took him in and took care of him. Uh, it's, it's how they kind of came when his first you know, encounter with them on his missionary journeys. But, but I think what's happening here, I think we'll never know. And I think it's interesting that we'll never really know when you talk about the thorn in the flesh, because then that can apply to any thorn in the flesh, right? right? You read it and go, well, I don't have an eye problem. You know, and, and no, we don't know what it was, but we all have a thorn in the flesh. We've all got something that we're wrestling with. And in that, he says, I've learned that in my weakness, his strength is actually appropriated in my life and becomes, you know, his strength is, 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 is revealed, and it's his strength and my weakness. I get to experience that. So we can all apply that. But, but I don't think we'll ever know what, what, what this thing was. I think what's happening here, whether he has an eye problem or not, here's what's happening. He's been speaking to an amanuensis, okay, a secretary, we, we believe, orally is writing this down for him. And so he's now, at the end of this letter, he's imagine, he's taking the pen and he's saying, okay, I'm going to write this part. And he is writing as if in all caps, like, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Do not miss this. This is me writing to you. And I don't want you to miss this. And so like a, like a, like a, like a kind of a heavyweight boxer, he's coming to the end of the round. And he's going to bring now the first thing I'm going to talk about is the clarity of the gospel. He's going to come back around like waiting for the bell to ring. But he's going to throw a few more jabs as if to say, hey, don't forget why I wrote you. Because it seems like he's closing out and bring all the love, let's go. And he goes, nope, no, nope. let, me, let, me, let me say this again so we're clear about it. Look at verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross. Now, I don't know if you've been thinking about circumcision a whole lot this week, but um, what this is, he's saying that that represents the law. Those who want to say, you got to do this and do this. He said, they have one motive and they're lacking courage. Watch this to say that it's actually by faith in the suffering and the finished work, the death of Christ. They don't want to be persecuted for talking about that. And you say, what, well, why, what, what? Listen, the gospel explicitly presented always brings offense. It always brings persecution so, so what is this? Let, Paul's been real clear. By faith, not works. And this is illogical. Even in hearing this, when we hear the gospel, it is offensive. It offends the mind. See, here's the debate. Paul says, Paul has come in and said, believe, then you're saved. Now live for God in response to what he's done. The Judaizers come in and they say, no, obey then you gain God's approval, then keep on obeying. And Paul said, and that, and that is not the gospel. And he's saying, they're preaching that because every, everybody's in on that. Like, what can I bring to the table? What can I do to measure this thing? See, the gospel of free grace offends the mind because it offends our self-righteousness. In fact, Paul had said earlier, he knew he was preaching the gospel when he was persecuted. This is wild. This is why after sermons, I'll preach something and I wonder what's wrong with my preaching. People come up and line up and say, Jeff, you did a great job. That meant a lot to me. Thank you so much. You're amazing. Um, Paul would preach a sermon and he'd get stoned. Like people want the like he calls a riot because he preached. Part of that is because of a different culture we're living in. Praise God, we can present the gospel. But I think we've got another problem in our culture that, that I want to talk about. See, how do you know? How do you know? If, um, if the gospel has really connected with, with you, it's offended you. It's been offensive. How do you know if you get it? It offends the mind. Uh, Paul, Paul says this. Look at verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 11. He says, but if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, 
why am I still being persecuted? Because I'd just be going along with everybody else. There's, no, there's nothing offensive about that. He, he says, in that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, this word offense, this is at the heart of the message today, really. Um, see, here's the test. Whether you get it or not, you've been offended by the gospel. And it still offends the mind. The gospel is an offense. This word, you might know this, the word offense here is scandalon. It's a transliterated word, which means they just took the, the Greek letters, made of a new word, because it's explicitly a biblical word, an ecclesiastical word. Um, so you have to look in parts of scripture. 25 times it's used in the Greek uh, Septuagint, the Old Testament Greek, and 15 times in the New. What does it mean? And it means stumbling block. It's, it's a stone of offense, kind of an interesting image. It, think of someone like tripping over something. The gospel is offensive and it trips us up. It, it messes with us and we have a hard time receiving it, if you will. See, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said this, for Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. Okay, so we want power and we want wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block, there it is, an offense, a scandal to the Jews and folly, not wisdom, to the, Greek, to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, everybody in Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's the power and he's the wisdom that we're looking for. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He's saying it messes with your mind. It's foolish. It's illogical. It's scandalous. When he was writing to the Romans, Roman Christians, um, Paul quoted Isaiah in Roman, uh, in, he, out of Isaiah 8. Look at, what it, look at what it says here in the Old Testament. And he will become, okay, the Messiah to come, a sanctuary, okay, a place of peace. He'll bring peace and a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It's a scandal on. It's a scandal. If you're tripped up by the gospel, if you wrestle with it intellectually, I've talked to several people today, um, uh, you're, you're, and if you're not a believer, you're halfway there. You're halfway there. You, if you're wrestling with it, even as a believer. See, here's the thing. Jesus did not come. Think about this. What was his central, back, what was his central message? What was the central thing that Jesus talked about? He didn't come as, we don't need another moral teacher. Do we? Really? Jesus didn't come as a moral teacher. He's that only after something else happens. He didn't come like, what was the central focus of his teaching? Think about that. What was it? We could say it was love. It was love. Didn't get him to the cross. I mean, you could say love, grace is radical stuff, but I would argue the central focus of Jesus teaching, watch this, was his identity, who he claimed to be. That's what got him on the cross. He claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to be the Messiah. And he ends up dying on the cross for us, for our sin. That's why he came. That's the central message of the gospel is that Jesus has come and he's died for us. Nobody's offended by Jesus saying, hey, love each other. Love each other, y'all. Love each other. And that's why a lot of churches, frankly, here in Dallas and, and around the nation, just, hey, listen, you got to just be like Jesus and love people, serve the poor, and just love people. Yes, yes. And we do that in spades around here. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is not what you do or what we do. It's what Christ has done. The only way you get to the cross and experience its power is by being offended by the cross. Not repulsed by it but offended by it. The gospel says you're more loved than you've ever dreamed while you're at the same time more sinful than you've ever imagined. And God loves you accepted because of what he's done for you. So how does the gospel offend us here in North Dallas? We're on North Dallas sites. We get answer that question. Um, it challenges our intellect, doesn't it? We're, ed we're educated people here. Come on. Like this, you're talking about a faith that really demands a miracle. In terms of the resurrection, the incarnation, all the above. It challenges our intelligence. It, it challenges our sensibilities. The, the cross, I, I, I've said it in our apologetics class, it doesn't go against reason. It makes logical sense. But it goes, it goes beyond reason. The, the cross, the gospel offends my self-reliance, doesn't it? The gospel exposes my impotence. Like Who wants to admit that they're, they're in need? We don't do that much. 
And yet J.N. Darby, the, the great theologian, he, preacher, he, he's the one who said, I've said it before, he said, necessity finds him out. You don't find anything much in life without your need for it. And a lot of us, we don't think we really need to be saved because we don't understand how wicked we are. It challenges our wickedness. The gospel offends the mind and defends the heart. It challenges our sense of justice, doesn't it? Like, wait, I, like I don't bring anything? Like, like good people, bad people are on the same plane? That's, that's offensive. That doesn't make sense. Don't I deserve a little something? When I bring something, it's intolerant. It's exclusive. You see, it offends the, uh, the, the religious and it offends the irreligious. Because the irreligious say, um, well, wait, good people get to God. Like everybody, everybody can, we're all good, essentially, and everybody can. Okay, good people get to God. What happens then for morally bankrupt people, bad people like me? I'm out. We're out. And that's all of us, if we really understand. See, it offends my even moral standing. The gospel is offensive. It offends the religious and the irreligious. It's why um, Sir Alfred Ayer, he was a great philosopher, um, professor, and, and he said this. He said the idea that Jesus died on the cross for our sin is intellectually contemptible and morally outrageous. And a lot of people go there. I have, a, I have a favorite band these days. Check them out. Gabe Price and Friends. Okay. Best band out there. Come at me. Okay. They, they have a song. Their lyrics are, are fire. They have a, they have a song called Heretic. And, and the song goes like this. Sing about Jesus. You are the empire. The promised land beneath my feet. The contrast that offends my firm theology. We tried to fit your ways in the boxes humans made. So either you're a heretic or you're the son of God. And the chorus goes like this. Offend my mind so that I can know you more. Break my heart so it looks more like yours. Offend my mind so that I can know you more. Offend my mind. Offend my mind. They're getting at the heart of this thing that it's, it, it, see, the gospel is exclusive. It, you know, Tim Keller, we, we've, we've quoted him before. He says it's the most inclusive exclusivity known to man. In other words, it's, there's only one way because it's not up to how good you are. And yet everyone's invited then. No one's left out because it's not about how moral you are. It's why if I were to ask you, hey, are you a Christian? And you were to respond by, well, I'm trying. You don't get it. You don't get it. I'm trying. We say that about people too. And I get it. Like we'll say, he's a really strong Christian. You know, and I know what that means. Like they're a person of faith and all the stuff. But, but we're not Christians because we've been good enough. You know, I'm trying to be one. No. You don't become a Christian by trying. You become a Christian by dying. That's offensive. That offends the mind, you see. But I would say this about your Christian friends who are offended by the gospel. Don't give up on them. If you're here today and you're offended, like you're stumbling over this thing, listen, don't give up. You're halfway there. You're halfway there. The problem in North Dallas, can I say it? We're not offended by the gospel. We're not offended either way. Revelation 3, Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, could he say it? Of the church in America. You're lukewarm. You're not offended by the gospel. Look at verse 13. He goes on. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Religious people, legalists always want you to join them and be, you know, the moral authority over you. Come join us. They've tripped over the stumbling block of the gospel. The clear to the gospel is that we're saved by faith, not by works. This is the message you hear every Sunday you come. Let's talk about the centrality of the gospel then. And we'll spend less time on these next two. The centrality, the center of everything in the Christian life is the gospel. We say it this way. It's not the ABCs and then bam, let's move on to other things. It's the A to Z. The gospel drives everything in life. Everything recalibrates back to the gospel. 
We all, it's why worship, worship and, and daily gathering of God's people, weekly gathering corporately, but every day you get in his word, Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. Remind me again of the gospel. Wait, we're going to have a Lord's Supper because we're going to remember again. Let's keep on reminding ourselves of this because it's central to our lives. The gospel separates us from every religion, every other ideology. And our church is centered on the gospel. It's why we say we're all about Jesus. We're not aligned to any political party. We're not going to push any candidate because Jesus is Lord of our lives. He's the one who changes lives. He is the one who's captured our hearts. Look at verse 14. But far be it from me, here's what he's saying, to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me. You see, there's this this expulsion of a a greater love that has eliminated everything else. I'm crucified now because of what Christ is. He's crucified for me. I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but new creation. He's saying religious, irreligious, none of that matters. What matters is a regenerated heart that happens through the gospel. So watch, he says this, far be it from me. Uh, Some translations say, God forbid. Maybe your translation, others say that. Now, God is not in that phrase, by the way, in that Greek, Greek term. What he's saying is this is the strongest negative, emphatic negative he could come up with. Um, never, ever, never, ever may I boast in anything but the cross. What do you boast in? What are you boasting in? In a minute, when we hear boasting, we think, well, I'm, I did a great job. I gotta, I'm really something. I'm really intelligent. I'm so smart. Look at all my stuff. Look how good I look. I'm boasting in my... You know, we think that, right? I don't know if we ever talk like that, but maybe it happens. Um, but, but we boast in something. You're boasting in something. What do you put your confidence in? We said it throughout this series. Where do you seek justification? That's Paul's word. How do you seek to validate yourself? Through your work? Maybe it's your work. Maybe it's your, it's, your, it's your looks. It's your money. It's what you own. It's your clothes. It's something you're presenting. Your performance, the approval of others. We all are boasting in something. And it's the thing, and you could say it this way, it's the thing that if it were taken away from you, you go, I don't even know if I want to live anymore. Good things that become God things. And we get all of our love out of order. What is the thing that you know is true above all the lies that are coming at you all day long? Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is it. Now, he knew a lot more than the cross. But this is, this, is, this is what it means. I focus on the cross. I go back to what Jesus has done for me. And I know that we miss it as Christians. I like to think we're, we, we get it a little more than most. But Christians in America, I know we miss it. Because we have come to believe, it seems, some Christians have come to believe that we are here to moralize everybody. We're here to tell everybody where they're morally off. And I've said it this way, often it's not best for Christians to tell non-Christians, you're off, you're wrong, you're wrong, and you're wrong. We, our mission then becomes to moralize everybody. You tracking with me? Our mission becomes, let's make sure everybody is living moral lives and tell them what's right and what's wrong. You might say, well, Jeff, if we're not doing it, who's going to do it? Um, the Spirit of God? Here's what I mean. Our mission is not to run around as the moral police. Because we're truncating the gospel. Watch this. We're misrepresenting the gospel. We're saying the gospel is get your act together, then you'll be like us. That's not the gospel. The the explicit gospel is um, you can't save yourself. You need to come to Christ because he'll transform your heart. Then you'll start living right But that's really not even the point in your salvation. Come to faith in Christ, and it's free grace. You don't have to be good enough, nor have I been good enough. That's offensive. If we're going to offend people, let's offend them for all the right reasons, right? Let's offend them by pointing to the gospel. I mean, we we miss it, and then we then we teach people the gospel is about being moral, and we also say this is our mission to correct their vice. So we enter into the culture wars. We're here to win the culture wars instead of winning people to Jesus. This is heartbreaking for me to watch this, 
And the more we understand the gospel, the more we understand it is the entire focus of our lives. See, most people in, in, in North Dallas, this is how it plays out. This happens even in churches. And I, this will offend your mind, okay? That's why I'm here. Um, the, most, a, lot of, a lot of churches are doing this now. Um, hey, just love each other. That's really a central message. Love each other. Be like Jesus. Love, love it. It's all inclusive. It's everybody. And, and just love people. That's not offensive. And I'm not saying we have to offend people. I'm just saying that's not the gospel. Nobody's offended that Jesus said love everybody. Every religion says to love everybody. Look at Paul doesn't say, God forbid we don't feed the poor. And yet he did. He, he was about feeding the poor. He doesn't say, God forbid I don't keep the Ten Commandments. God forbid I don't keep the Sermon on the Mount. Now he's given us new morality. He's higher than anything. God forbid we don't follow all that stuff. No. He says, God forbid that we don't focus our entire lives on the gospel, which is Christ and the cross. I now have a new identity because I'm totally forgiven because of what he has done. God forbid anything else capture my mind or my heart that I boast in anything but the cross. I'd say it this way. It hardly matters. Hang with me. What Jesus said up against what he did. If you take away what he did on the cross, you do not have Christianity anymore. It's why Peter comes to him at a point. You remember this? Peter says, you're not going to die. And Jesus says, get behind me. What? Satan. That's satanic. I came to die. See, this is so central. So let's close by talking about the reality of the gospel. How does this impact my life? Grace in real life. It means that everything has changed. Look at verse 16. And as for all who walk by this rule, what is this rule? A new rule of life. Not a law, but the way of the Spirit, he's talked about. The new rule of life, the way of grace. Everybody who follows this rule, peace and mercy. Isn't that what we need more than anything? Be upon you and upon the, the, the Israel of God. This is the, the church, okay? The new Israel, the new, the new kingdom of God, people of God. Verse 17, from now on, let no one cause me trouble as if to say, don't come at me again with this. I don't want to hear about this anymore, for I bear on my body. I've been persecuted. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace, look at this last sentence in the whole thing. Of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen and amen. Notice earlier in verse 14, he didn't say the world is dead. He said, I've been crucified. Now I am dead to the world. You could say it this way. The world is dead to me. Nothing in the world can satisfy me. And if you're anxious, if you're worried, when you get upset, when you're angry, you're boasting in something else other than the cross. Because I've been crucified. If you have received Christ, all of the worldly pursuits, worldly desires, they have nothing on me anymore. Friends, that is the life of freedom. Nothing is driving me but the cross. A focused, centered life is a life that is free. You don't need more capacity. You need more focus on the gospel and what Christ has done for you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will find its rightful place. So center your hearts on him. Listen, we don't need another moral teacher, do we? And get better, work harder. We need someone to come and crush the evil in this world and crush the evil that is in our hearts. That's what we need. And that's what Christ has done. I'll end us with this story. Karl Barth was the, the, one of the eminent theologians of, of the last century, back in the 1900s. Some of y'all were alive back then. He was a German theologian. He wrote this, um, Church Dogmatics was his, his seminal work, his great work. Um, that, it has like, I mean, it's, it's volumes, like 12,000 pages. And he's brilliant mind. And someone asked him at the University of Chicago, he's speaking to a group of students. One of them asked him, what is like, of all the things you know, you're a brilliant thinker, how would you sum up Christianity or, or the greatest thing you've ever learned? And he said this. He said, I learned it on my mother's knee when I was a little kid through a song. He said, this is the greatest thing I've ever learned, I've ever known. Jesus loved me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. The greatest thing I've ever learned. 
And it's true of all of us here. Let's pray. Before God Almighty, you come now. With your head bowed, eyes closed, focused. What is he saying to you today? Some of you need to clarify where you stand. And if you've never received Christ, if you, by faith, you can say yes to him. It's true. It offends the mind. It offends your heart. It offends our sinful nature. But he says, come to me. You don't have to do a thing. I've done it all for you. So receive his grace right now. Lord, come into my life and make me the person you've created me to be. I give you my life. Now to live for you. Lord, help all of us to always come back to the cross all week long. And even as we celebrate now, so many lives have been transformed coming into our family. Brothers and sisters, may we cheer them on and be reminded again that we've died, crucified to the world, that we might live for you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.